everyone. Um, and welcome to Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger with Dr. Julie Z. Uh, my name's Lizzie Grennan Browning. Um, I'm the History Fellow with the Environmental Resilience Institute. Um, and before I introduce Dr. Z today, um, I have a few items of business in explaining the origins of the event, of the event and acknowledging those who have helped to make this event possible. Um, first, I wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington is built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi and Shawnee peoples as past, present and future caretakers of this land. Um, this event is inspired by the art and history exhibition, Hoosier Lifelines, Environmental and Social Change Along the Monon, 1847 to 2020. Um, and the exhibit was sponsored by the Environmental Resilience Institute and the Eskenazi School of Art, Architecture and Design. At a time when Indiana and our broader nation faces growing risks from environmental change, public health threats and economic turmoil, the exhibition asks us to consider what will sustain our communities in times of diminishing resources and accelerating environmental change. Addressing the legacies of environmental racism remains a fundamental mission in our collective efforts um, to create a more resilient future. So this exhibit is, um, it's a traveling exhibit. It's headed next to New Albany in August. So we hope you can join us in Southern Indiana. Um, in the meantime, you can see a virtual walkthrough of the Bloomington exhibit that recently showed um, on the Grunwald Gallery's website. So I want to extend my sincere thanks to this event's co-sponsors, the IU Center for Research on Race and Ethnicity in Society, the IU Bloomington History Department, and the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute. And I wanna thank the following ERI staff members for their help coordinating the event, Vanessa Worthy, Joe Lang, and Jonathan Hines. And now it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Julie Z. Dr. Z is a leading scholar of environmental justice, professor and founding chair of the American Studies Department at University of California, Davis and founding director of the Environmental Justice Project for UC Davis's John Muir Institute for the Environment. Dr. Z's research investigates environmental justice and environmental inequality, culture and environment, race, gender and power, and urban community health and activism. Her research has been funded by the Ford Foundation, the American Studies Association, the American Association of University Women, the UC Humanities Research Institute, among others. Dr. Z's books include Noxious New York, The Racial Politics of Urban Health and Environmental Justice, which was published by MIT Press in 2006 um, and was the winner of the American Studies Association's John Hope Franklin Publication Prize. Her next book, Fantasy Islands, Chinese Dreams and Ecological Fears in an Age of Climate Crisis was published by the University of California Press in 2015. Recently, she published Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger with UC Press uh, just last year, and she is the editor of Sustainability, Approaches to Environmental Justice and Social Power, which was published with NYU Press. She's also written prolifically over 60 journal articles and book chapters on a wide range of topics, primarily in the fields of, of environmental studies and the environmental humanities, geography, and public policy. Dr. Z works in collaboration with environmental scientists, engineers, social scientists, humanists, and community-based organizers. Um, she's truly an interdisciplinary scholar um, who does impressive work. She's also an active mentor for first-generation and low-income students in graduate education with a 15-year active involvement with the UC President's postdoctoral fellowship program. So Dr. Z, thank you so much. It's a tremendous honor to have you here today, uh, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, um, Lizzie, for that um, introduction. It's been such a pleasure to um, reconnect with you and to learn of the um, important work that you're doing and to um, visit the, the virtual exhibit as well in Indiana. So um, thank you and thank you, Vanessa, for your help with the um, technical um, uh, support. Um, if, if I was more competent with, with music, I would be playing right now um, Stevie Wonder's 1975 um, song Saturn. Um, which opens um, packing my bags, going away to a place where the air is clean on Saturn. There's no place to, send, uh, to sit and watch people die. We don't fight our war wars the way you do. We put back all the things we use on Saturn. There's no sense to keep on doing such crimes, end quote. 
um, in this little snippet, you can hear um, un about unclean air, violence, war, and consumerism, and how they are all wrapped up in Stevie Wonder's extraterrestrial longing for a world better than Earth, uh, the 1975 version of Earth. Four decades later, his lyrical call is both more urgent and feels ever distant. In a nation where rapacious corporate capitalism is plundering natural resources, where oil and gas um, interests have funded um, climate change denial and direct what passes for environmental policy, may, different context now post-election. Um, but this idea of a world without clean air and without war, rampant consumerism and extractive capitalism sees, seems nearly impossible to imagine. But it is in this context then that imagination and action become newly essential. So today's questions um, that I'm going to throw out, and obviously we're not going to answer them, um, is what does radical hope look like now in 2021 in the face of interconnected environmental, political, and social disasters? Um, what does freedom look like in the face of this uh, forms of environmental and state violence, um, and specifically in climate change in its myriad forms, um, political and technological surveillance, militarization, and policing across borders? Um, so this question of, you know, what we're going to look at um, now, what does it mean to think of non-naive radical hope if, say, for example, you follow the science of climate? Um, how can we even hold on to this idea or believe in non-naive radical hope? Um, and yet, I would say this is why we have to now more than ever. Um, there is an urgency of the moment um, that we have to look, stare straightly in. Um, and so today's talk is going to be based uh, largely on my most recent book, Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger, um, but it's also going to talk a little bit more about climate than I do in the book. Um, so what are, um, what are the moments, uh, what are the disasters? Of course, many of you already know this. I don't know exactly who's in the room, but I'm sure there are environmental scientists, environmental studies folks. Um, many, um, if you're not familiar with the idea of the great acceleration, um, that's the idea that sort of in 1950, you see this like rapid rise um, in all types of resource uses. So it's not just carbon in other words. Um, it, this, but it is also carbon. Um, and so the, I, there was a report that the University of California put out a few years ago called Bending the Curve. Um, and this was you know, the idea of bending the, uh, the, climate, uh, the carbon curve. And of course, um, you know, I think that many of us now in a COVID moment understand the idea of bending the curve much more than we did um, or could even think about bending the climate curve. We, we do intuitively understand, I know I did, uh, I do now because of the full year of the pandemic, how important it is to bend that curve, whether it's carbon or, or um, COVID. Um, so uh, again, you know, just many of you know this, but it's worth repeating, you know, what are, what, what's, the, what's at stake and what are the impacts? This is a World Meteorological Organization cover report, and it, you know, talks about floods, sea level rise, ocean acidification, um, threats to agriculture, climate refugees, um, uh, deaths with heat waves and wildfires um, and, and threats to ecosystems. Um, just on the um, question of wildfires um, itself, um, in California, um, this is another visualization of the of impacts. You know, you could just look at this and say, okay, well, what does it look like at two degrees, three degrees, and business as usual, uh, uh, no interact, um, no intervention, five degrees, and so on. Um, so what is, in other words, the moment, what are the moments of dangers that we're facing? Um, in California, where I live, climate change has led to hotter temperatures and earlier and more intense wildfires that have burned over 4.5 million acres this year, by far the most on historical recorded record. So many of you saw the visual, uh, the images of California where the sky looked like a bright orange, which um, kind of uh, brought to people's ideas, oh, this looks like Blade Runner 2049. Um, uh, crises of political legitimacy and overt or state sanctioned violence define the US in ways that were not formerly visible to the mainstream. Of course, there were always people who understood um, the levels of um, state sanctioned violence against particular groups of people, but there's a widening out of the, the question of those political and environmental dangers. Um, wildfires in California really took away that idea that you could kind of insulate yourself from risk. There was literally no place to go and you couldn't go outside because of the wildfires and then you couldn't go, go into communal you know, areas because of COVID. You know, so there was this sense of sort of trappedness and that sense of catastrophe, which you know, I think many people kind of, many people were able to 
ignore for a very long time. So crises of political legitimacy, again, um, are become newly visible to those who were able to um, ignore it. Authoritarianism is linked to racism, anti-immigrant and anti-refugee sentiment, gender violence, militarism, and corporate capitalism. That idea that crises are interconnected, again, police and state sanctioned violence, pandemic and public health, and climate disaster is apparent to those around the world who protest actively and vigorously against fascists, and also the extreme and widening economic and social inequality made exp exponentially worse under COVID. So the climate crisis, like the political crisis writ large, has come home in the shape of hurricanes, heat waves, and wildfires, and the old political order is crumbling. Um, scientifically, you know, this image um, kind of captures you know, the idea of the hothouse earth, um, self-reinforcing changes leading to extreme climate warning and sea level rise. And the idea, of course, is that those with the least vulnerability are hardest hit. Those include um, climate change refugees, um, residents in the Pacific Islands and the Caribbean, also the um, indigenous um, uh, Alaska and also in Louisiana, um, tribal communities. And some have called climate change a, cri a crime against humanity. Again, these crimes against um, humanity include drought, flooding, wildfires, and water acidification wide and wide-scale death of ocean life. Climate disruption is largely settled science, yet politicians continue to, quote, debate the questions of whether the planet can, quote, afford to deal with climate change. Social science and humanists then also focus on the social and economic systems that exacerbate environmental abuses, unsustainable extraction of nature and inequality. And of course, these consequences are massive, leading to the global movement of people and increased um, violence and war, and most recently seen in the mi migrations of people in the Central American um, countries like Nicar Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala to the US as a result of hurricanes. So as, as I've already kind of talked about, there are so many injustices, many of which we're familiar with. Um, climate change, uh, very simply put, will expand and magnify inequality. And that's both spatial geographic inequality and economic um, and political inequality. So uh, simply put, the IPCC report um, said the poorest people in the world who have virtually nothing to do with causing global warming will be high on the list of victims as climatic disruptions intensify. Again, this idea of the people least responsible being the hardest hit is the fundamental injustice in um, climate change. Um, and so, you know, these histories and this global map, for example, red is the highest risk. You can see, you know, the highest risks are in the, the global south, in Africa, um, in Asia, and in Latin America. Of course, this is also a historical map that cannot be separated with um, histories of post-colonialism and modernity itself. Um, what does it mean in the U.S. context as people who sit within U.S. institutions? Um, uh, I, I did not know this um, until I read an article, so now I always put it in, even if it doesn't perfectly fit whatever talk I have, I'm doing. The countries with the largest cumulative carbon emissions since 1750 is the U.S. 25% of historical carbon emissions from 1750 belongs to the U.S. Until 1882, it was the United Kingdom, predictably because of um, colonialism. So I think you know, it's important for us to think about you know, what is our historical, um, ethical, uh, and geographic um, responsibility. So in terms of environmental justice and climate change, um, this is now you know, where I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bring us back to you know, the non-naive radical hope, even though it doesn't you know, feel like it, but that's precisely the point. Um, environmental justice and climate change, uh, it really talks about, you know, again, this question of distributive impacts um, disparate impacts in the US and the world. And uh, it, environmental justice analyses of climate change really focus on um, unequal power at the core of the analysis of both what are the causes of these problems and also what, what might responses look like. Um, and so this, uh, I always like to talk about how in 1997, as a new you know, um, uh, employee in environmental justice group, I remember seeing um, a, a fact sheet from the Environmental Justice and Climate Change um, Coalition. And they talked about how there, what the, um, an impact of a major hurricane would be in New Orleans. And I remember looking at the fact sheet, because this is like, you know, pre-digital, um, and thinking, no, 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 that cannot happen. That's not going to happen. That's like a dystopian novel. Um, and I tell this story because I think that it shows, at least for myself, this idea of innocence, you know, and this idea of 
um, a disaster that I was unable to see myself until it happened literally the way the fact sheet predicted in 2005. We are in a moment where that ability to have innocence about disasters, whether they're racial in the form of police violence or environmental, you know, we cannot live in our continued innocence and put our head down into the sand. We cannot turn away. Um, and so that is both the moment we're in and the opportunity of what we can learn from environmental justice movements. Um, and so when Environmental Justice and Climate Change Coalition imagined what a hurricane would look like in Katrina, and that is indeed what happened in Katrina in 2005, and also there were versions of this in, you know, the disproportionality, at least, maybe not the, you know, hardcore policing um, in, in all the various hurricanes that have happened since Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Maria, certainly in Puerto Rico, um, Hurricane Sandy, and so on. And so these are two examples of um, what I talk about in the third chapter of my book, um, which talks about um, Kivalina, uh, which is a, an Arctic indigenous um, village um, that is in um, Alaska, it's Inukiak. Um, and they are one of 400 um, indigenous villages um, that are currently, not in the future, being affected by sea level rise. Um, Kivalina is not only unique in that they sued um, the oil and gas companies for the harm of, um, of uh, oil and gas on uh, their um, village, but the lawsuit was um, thrown out because the, uh, the court said it was not a legal issue, it was a political one. So again, I want us to think about this idea of separating political and legal. Um, it is these separations that the environmental justice movement has always rejected. And environmental justice movement is where I will start to think about, or I think we have to think about this idea about the non-naive radical hope. So uh, I'm going to talk um, about environmental justice um, in a moment of danger, which comes from um, this series, American Studies Now. It's this short, teachable kind of public history um, books of scholarship. And the royalties for this book go to the Community Water Center in Visalia and Uprose, uh, which is a community organization that I've worked with since uh, for about 27 years. Um, the key question of this book um, is, uh, what crossroads and moment of danger we are, are, are we in now? What might we learn from, uh, from environmental justice movements in our moment of danger? Um, the book is about, I think, you know, this identifying the idea again of the crossroads and the moment of danger. Where are the dangers? It's in the industry and carbon emissions, but it's also political dangers um, that enable and magnify those um, emissions. Again, the anti-immigration, anti-refugee politics, nationalist, uh, populist authoritarianism, Milita militarized security discourse, racist policies, and they are being linked um, internationally. This book um, seeks to focus on the significance of environmental justice moment, uh, movements um, and argues that the moment of crisis is the moment of rupture, in part because dominant belief systems and ideologies that dispute them come into view or sharper relief. Um, we are living in a precarious um, moment um, where with the warmest years ever measured, active assaults on the disenfranchised and on institutions that serve the public interest and global inequality ever rising. So this um, moment and crossroads of danger are both old and also new. Um, part of the older version is, you know, living under the uh, almost complete command of neoliberalism, um, which idealizes markets and capital, consumer subjectivities and values over communitarian notions of belonging and justice. We, um, and specifically I'm talking about people, um, disempowered people, people of color, um, uh, people, uh, indigenous peoples, we, and, and now everybody, have lived and died under neoliberalism for at least three decades, but under changing conditions. This valorization of privatization, finance, and the market, and the retrenchment of the state and the public is both dominant and also under stress. One scholar writes, the economic crisis is a moment of rupture. And he was writing in 2008. We're in the, another crisis, uh, you know, in 2021 um, under COVID. Um, but again, crisis is part of the, the, what we have to understand um, uh, theoretically. Uh, ideology under crisis can delegitimize and weaken the prevailing um, regimes of power, profit, and privilege. Um, and again, I want to say that even though my book focuses on the US, this is not a US specific phenomenon. Um, the, uh, to argue that would be an American exceptionalist narrative, which as an American studies scholar is, you know, we don't believe in and also is, is just not true. So what we're seeing in the US is connected to what's happening in Brazil. 
what's happening in India, what's happening in um, Hungary, the Philippines, and in Poland. This is a global moment of danger. At the same time, there is a growing awareness of environmental and other injustices in the form of these vibrant social movements that are also on the rise, in part because of um, the, the new ways in which social media has accelerated you know, the command and information and sharing of, of those struggles. Um, although the global economic system is more integrated under neoliberalism, hostility to immigrants and refugees is high, and economic inequality has reached levels never before seen in human history. I had to update these stats post-COVID from when I wrote the book. And so these are updated stats. The three richest people in the world, you know who they are. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the three richest people in the U.S., Bezos, Buffett, and Musk, own as much wealth as the bottom half of the population. So three people own as much wealth as half of the US. Um, the, world's, the world's 2,100 billionaires have more wealth than 4.6 billion people who make up 60% of the planet's population. This pandemic has exacerbated economic disparities across the world. And so the, the rich are the very rich have done the best. And so in um, 2020 alone, global billionaire wealth increased by 3.9 trillion. 2020 was also the warmest year on record. And so you can see this um, interweaving of climate and economic inequality. And interwoven with those inequalities are crises um, of modernity, including faith in technical authority, authority and scientific knowledge and media institutions, of course, in the US being you know, cheerleaded on by you know, um, the, the president who basically you know, attacked facts and attacked science and attacked the media. Um, and the, and we, the crisis is also the winding down of the American century, although American exceptionalism refuses to die through slogans like make, make America great again. Um, and so the book Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger is, um, comes out of my own experience and um, observations of working for about 27 years, starting as a student activist um, with movements and in movements. So where then, given everything I've said, is the non-naive radical hope? Where can we feel any hope at all? I think the hope exists in the movements themselves. Um, the hope um, begins because uh, the book, I, I argue, um, begins with a simple observation. Those on the environmental justice front lines have been living, dying, and fighting for a very long time. The resurgence of explicit racism is unsurprising for the justice activists who see their lives structured by uh, legacies of domination and public policy. Um, important social movements for uh, environmental and climate justice are more mobilizing large numbers of people, including virtually, across broad national and global scales. So my focus in the book is on the environmental justice movements themselves, the cultures and analytics they advance and embody. Environmental justice movements offer um, they offer important um, signposts for us right now in troubled times because the movements and the people who make them have done important ideological work grounded in the everyday and in long lasting struggles for justice. And, you know, we could talk in the Q&A about like what my time scale is, like how long am I talking about? Um, but the book starts with the premise that environmental damages are interwoven with political and social conflicts. And thus it examines how organizers, communities and movements fight they survive, they love, and they create in the face of the violence, um, both environmental, political, and social, that challenges the conditions of life themselves. So what the book tries to do is to thread um, a few kind of iconic, and in some cases not so visible, um, environmental justice struggles together, as they themselves are bringing themselves together. Um, there is, uh, and part of the, the book is really focused on doing um, sort of some synthetic work um, because it's very different from when I started working on environmental justice in the 1990s, where there was a lot of work you had to do about empirical documentation. Like there, a lot of the debate then was, oh, is this race or class? Were, were poor people there before or did the pollution go? I mean, that was the kind of question that, that we were having. This is a very different political moment. So people, you can say standing rock and, and most people kind of know what happened. But there's also, because of the speed 
um, and the number of um, campaigns, it's also hard sometimes to get a sense of like, okay, what started, who are the actors, what happened and so on. And yet I did not wanna just do case study, case study, case study. I wanted to connect it to the um, scholarship and the keywords in um, our field. And you know, I'm talking American studies, indigenous studies, ethnic studies, gender studies, and so on. So you can see, you know, what I chose to do, and you know, I could have chosen very differently, you know, different case studies. Um, I, uh, chapter one looks at Standing Rock, um, Tar Sands, and Keystone through the lenses of settler colonialism, extraction, gender violence, and each chapter also has an anchor organization or network um, for that uh, for that struggle. The second chapter looks at water racism and justice. Talks primarily about Flint and the Central Valley, where I work and do research. The key the keywords are privatization, neoliberalism, and the community water center. So the third chapter is the one that really focuses, or at least you know, tries to in, in, uh, 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 introduce this idea of restorative environmental justice and the po uh, the politics of um, the politics of non naive radical hope through again Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, um, climate justice in Kivalina, um, and Uprose in New York is the anchor organization there. And so these are just snapshots of there are literally hundreds and possibly thousands of protests and protesters in the US. And you know, if you're gonna look globally, um, that have foregrounded this convergence of environmentalism and social injustice and inequality. Environmental justice activists um, in the US also make alliances um, across the globe and mourn the victims of environmental violence and assassination, um, including land defenders like Berta Cas Caceres in Honduras, um, it, further back, Ken Sarawiwa in Nigeria and Chico Mendes in Brazil, all of whom um, lost their lives in their struggles against dams, oils, and forestry interests. And internationally extrajudicial judicial killings of those who oppose economic development and deforestation have accelerated in recent years, with the death rate rising in the last four years to an average of two activists a week. So my starting point is really simple. Um, it's just that environmental justice movements are freedom struggles. Um, what does that mean? Um, environmental justice movements, who they are, what they are, who is involved and what they're fighting against and for help us understand the historical and cultural um, uh, moment that we're in and the resistance to violence, death and destruction of lives and bodies through movements, cultures and stories. Um, in other words, environmental justice movements um, provide a soundtrack of freedom in a world on fire. So simply put, environmental justice is a freedom struggle that's particularly significant now. It's intersectional and it crosses time and space. Um, when I say uh, connective, environmental justice in its founding principles connected race, class, indigeneity, gender, and environmentalism, and fundamentally at the most basic level, social and environmental justice. This expanding resonance um, in a broader sense of this environmental justice worldview and framework, I think is also something to you know, hold on to hope for. Um, there is more uptick or more understanding of the environmental justice worldview. And I think that's good for everybody. Um, so this expanding resonance is a concrete response to intensifying and interconnected conditions of pollution and inequality. So environmental justice, again, the scholars and the organizers have for over three decades articulated how race, indigeneity, class, and environmental inequality are linked in this toxic brew. Um, and so there has been a focus for a very long time in the environmental justice movement um, to connect to mainstream environmentalism, the civil rights movement, and also how um, environmental racism is connected to global resource exploitation inflected through race and racism, colonialism, and xenophobia. So the environmental justice movements matter um, because it, they offer a, a framework that is about expansion, connection, and change governed by the belief, um, and this is from the 2002 principles of the um, working together, that we need each other and we are stronger with each other. And so again, I'll just repeat that again. The environmental justice movement in 2002 um, created principles that said we need each other and we are stronger with each other. What does that mean? Um, environmental justice, um, uh, that perspective, that belief matters now more than ever as justice activists um, and, and the broader public face hydra headed assaults. Um, again, on climate, but also on immigrants and refugees, LBGTQ and abortion rights, voter suppression and broader retrenchment from the gains of social movements um, in and gender, environmentalism and civil rights in shaping public policy and discourse. And so I just wanna be absolutely clear 
for me, that my starting premise is that unjust environments are rooted in racism, capitalism, militarism, colonialism, land theft of native peoples, and gender violence. The status quo is too deeply invested in the institutional forces and ideological structures that exacerbate already existing conditions of injustice. And there's a quote that I use in the book from Tom Goldtooth, who's the founder of the Indigenous Envi Environmental Network. And he says, the system isn't broken, it was built to be this way. And so I think I would just like you know, to direct to you, if you're not familiar with these principles, you know, the principles of environmental justice, the principles of working together, um, the Hamas principles for democratic organizing, which really undergird the environmental justice movement and how it interacts um, with outside the movement, the Bali principles of climate justice, and most recently, I think very fascinating, the indigenous principles of just transition. Again, this idea of linkages is really the most important thing I think that the environmental justice movement has offered. Um, so in terms of how this plays out in the climate justice movements, um, the movements are very highly networked in both local and transnational coalitions. Um, you could see this in the keep it in the ground, which is just the idea of like keep, keep oil in the ground, don't, don't let it come out. And the idea again of land defenders. Um, and uh, what's really interesting also is um, environmental justice and just transition came out of the late, uh, the mid 1990s, which was a coalition of oil and gas workers working with environmentalists um, to, to also think about how oil and gas workers from the labor standpoint, union um, workers could, could uh, be part of a sustainable transition. So that's part of that, um, that uh, genealogy. Um, we are seeing this a lot in terms of thinking about the Green New Deal and thinking about the People's Green New Deal, which is an important um, idea within that as well. And environmental justice movements and activists are key figures in both the Green New Deal and also thinking about how the new, uh, the new Green Deal um, can, can exist um, in a way that also balances out technological innovation with focusing on communities, you know, so that this isn't just a technological fix as well. Um, so again, you know, this question of um, the U.S. responsibilities and um, and what our role in this is really, I think, you know, needs to be um, thought about, but not through a lens of American exceptionalism or through a lens of sort of technological innovation only. This is again, not anti-technology, but that, th that this is just a technical problem. Um, this is also a historical, cultural, and racial one as well. So American exceptionalism in a post-American context is devastatingly clear in the case of climate and climate change and climate policy um, when we look at the, this question of justice and disproportionality. Again, always worth reminding the US has 5% of the world's population, give or take, and is responsible for 28% of the world's carbon um, emission, excess carbon emissions. And just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of carbon emissions. So I wanted to also just um, throw out for, uh, for some of you, if you aren't familiar with the Climate Justice Alliance, um, that you take a look at some of their um, frameworks for what a just transition looks like. And I don't have time to really go into this, but I think it's a really powerful um, um, a coalition of coalitions um, that is trying to really think about just transition in this expansive and historical and very fundamentally interdisciplinary and justice oriented worldview. So on the left hand, you see this idea of the extractive economy and on the right uh, living economy. But you know, this idea of extraction and one of the problems is a pretty broad kind of policy or technical oriented discussions. So, you know, militarism, enclosure, consumerism and colonialism, and then regeneration, um, thinking about deep democracy and um, caring and sacredness, um, care in other words. Um, so uh, in the book, I talk briefly about Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Maria. Um, it always kind of uh, throws me off when, you know, I just found out, I just realized my students, you know, were five years old when, when Katrina happened, because in, in a lot of ways for me, Katrina was this, you know, I mean, I, I was an environmental justice organizer. I knew about environmental racism, but that again, that sense of my own innocence of like, you know, how could the government abandon, you know, large swathes of people? And now we have this idea of like, just kind of accepting that that's the cynicism of that. I think you know what activists always do is retain the outrage and refuse the cynicism. And that's really also an important lesson from the movement because how else are you going to be in the movement for the long haul? 
So Hurricanes Katrina and Maria show how existing political and environmental systems perpetuate these deep social, spatial, and racial injustices. And they are not unique historically uh, uh, to our moment. They are historical. Writer Pankaj Mishra um, talks about in this op-ed, the religious, religion of whiteness is a suicide cult. And he quotes James Baldwin and Du Bois who note the deep psychological investments in whiteness that have environmental and spatial dimensions. And this is a Baldwin quote, the rulers of the higher races struggling to hold on to what they have stolen from their captives, captives and unable to look into the mirror will precipitate a chaos throughout the world, which if it does not bring life on the planet to an end, will bring about a racial world, war, war that the world has never seen. And so there's also Olufemi um, Tayo, who's a philosopher at Georgetown, you know, talks about this idea that we're in this moment, we can either go through, towards like climate apartheid or climate um, reparations, you know? And so this idea of, you know, what, where are we at? What, you know, like we cannot just continue to go back to this normal. And you can see a lot of this discussion, you know, in terms of like the pandemic ending and, you know, going back to normal. And there are others who say, you know, well, you know what? normal wasn't okay for a large number of people. So that in a lot of ways that just recovery, just uh, post COVID conversation is very similar to the existing conversations that climate justice has um, been talking about. So whiteness, according to Du Bois, talks about the ownership of the earth forever and ever. But Mishra notes the descendants of the landlords of the earth find themselves besieged at home and abroad, their authority as overlords, policemen and interpreters of the globe increasingly challenged. So we're in the suicide cult of the moment. Um, and this is very clear in matters environmental um, and climate oriented. Um, so environmental justice as freedom means engaging again with history, violence, imaginary and visionary perspectives and environmental justice and environmental justice movements offer a structure of healing. For, I don't know if there are any humanists in the room, um, but there, uh, that is a term obviously for Marxist um, cultural critic Raymond Williams. And when he talks about structure of feelings, it's advancing an analysis that links the social to the personal to a theory of the social that is also um, not just institutional or formal. So environmental justice as freedom can mean freedom from violence, um, from these histories and systems that structure the present. But it can, uh, in other words, history, freedom from oil and gas and a carbon economy that trades in death and destruction. But it also means a freedom to create and imagine a world different from the common sense that we have um, on our own. So environmental justice is more than resistance to environmental racism and colonialism, even though that itself would be enough. Um, what environmental justice does is offer um, a, a, a set of concepts, a worldview, living practices that cross time, generation, and space. Freedom is a capacious set of practice and a way of living um, that intersects with realms of social relations, including gender, youth, and sexuality. Environmental justice movements, cultures, and worldviews are a counter-hegemonic philosophy of practice, a search for freedom beyond local communities fighting bad and environmental regulatory systems. It's not just a struggle for state-centered policy, incorporation, or reformist tinkering. Environmental justice challenges the status quo rather than fixing a system grounded in domination, racial terror, and colonialism. So these are just some of the um, examples that I talk about in the book. Climate justice and environmental justice advocates conceptualize and reframe their problems and center their perspectives and lived experience um, and struggles. So people of color, particularly African-Americans and indigenous peoples have been made to live within environmental and bodily risk through and in history, including dispossession and racism. Insurgency and environmental justice as a freedom struggle can be based beyond incorporation into liberal democracy or under conditions of settler colonialism. For environmental justice, creative, generative, and bottom-up rela relationships are the raison d'etre. So environmental justice movements have always been about cultures of freedom through imagining and enacting solidarity, radical hope, anti-consumerism, and anti-capitalism. So that's why in the book I talk you know, about Standing Rock you know, the art camp at Standing Rock or the youth running in Standing Rock. And if for those of you who don't know, the youth just ran at Standing Rock to get Biden to shut down um, uh, the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. So in February. Um, and then just, you know, a couple of other um, texts I, I would, you know, urge some of you, especially those of you who teach, to take a look at. One is this um, wonderful Boots Riley directed film called Sorry to Bother You, uh, which, and Boots Riley, you know, is, an, is a very political rapper. And he talks a lot about rebellion stories and how we don't hear enough rebellion stories in media. And so, you know, what does he do? He creates this film, you know, that is, a, is an iconic rebellion story. There is an amazing short um, uh, series on climate justice called The North Pole, 
which is uh, two season arc, seven minute episodes, very teachable in classrooms as well. So I think if you look around, you will see um, these stories of rebellion um, everywhere and the stories of climate justice. It's it, at Standing Rock, it's in hip hop and song and in spoken word. And those stories are echoed back also to um, black freedom struggles as well. So radical singer and uh, poet Gil Scott Heron said of his song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, that the revolution was about how, quote, the first place has to take place, the first change is in your mind. You have to change your mind before you change the way you live and the way you move. It'll be something you see and suddenly you realize that I'm on the wrong page or I'm on the right, right page, and, but I'm on the wrong note. But I've got to get into sync with everyone else to understand what's going on in this country. And so, you know, what's going on is a Marvin Gaye song. You know, these are these are things that you hear threads of over and over again in, in um, especially Black freedom songs and struggles and in popular culture, especially in the 60s. Uh, Robin Kelly says progressive social movements don't just produce statistics and narratives of oppression, rather the best ones do what great poetry does, transport us to another place, compel us to relive horrors, and more importantly, enable us to imagine a just society. Uh, we must remember that the conditions and the existence of social movements enable its participants to imagine something different, to realize that things don't need to be this way, or to put another way, the most radical art is not protest art, but that which takes us to another place, a different way of seeing, a different way of feeling. So these um, cultural productions, I think, do that. Um, so, you know, put in, in short, you know, if I wanted to just, you know, be very simple, listen to the climate justice, uh, li listen to the climate scientists, the climate just, uh, the justice activists, the artists, and the young. Um, they are right. They have always, they are always right. <laughs> You know, um, so environmental justice struggles are a set of cautiously hopeful stories about future and freedom, stories that we desperately need now, especially when the notion of freedom, it feels under stress and doubt because of climate change. The optimism and the pessimism is that environmental justice movements have been fighting and they continue to fight against authoritarianism, extractive industries, rapacious corporate capitalism, white supremacy and government corruption for a long time. And the optimism is that the arguments that those advocates have been making are gaining visibility and traction outside local communities. Um, advocates and movements denaturalize the common sense and in doing so force a confrontation of the beast within that seems ready to devour the many in the service of the few. Environmental justice movements and uh, frameworks and praxis matters now more than ever as a prin principled base from which to uh, face our collective planetary future. Living in denial does not make the problem go away, whether that problem is climate change or COVID-19. Um, even though there is a psychological and sociological phenomenon of shifting baselines that start to normalize mass death um, in, the face, in the context of COVID. Um, though most of the US would prefer to ignore our histories and our debts to each other, as well as our relations to the rest of the world, thanks to our embracingly uh, our bracingly enduring nationalist um, parochialism, the climate scientists is cl science is clear and the justice activists are right. So where is the hope? The hope is in the history, in the stories of um, people like the abolitionist Benjamin Clay and I, uh, um, Alay, and I don't have time to go into his story um, now, but I, I highly recommend you know you read you read about um, him. He's an amazing figure, but he's basically why the Quakers became abolitionists. There's no real natural reason why the Quakers became abolitionists. He shifted um, his, you know, ab uh, Quakerism to abolition. And it was very unpopular at the time. He's a, a hilarious, fascinating person. He holds the world's record for you know, being thrown out of Quaker congregations. I think he was thrown out of um, like six of them. And actually there, uh, he, there was an apology written um, by one of the Quake, uh, congregations to him recently that actually made me cry. It was very moving. Um, so uh, cultural production, creativity, and beauty are necessary to get through the moments of danger we inhabit, the wars without end, the nihilism and the violence, and the end of the planet as we know it. Having clarity and inspiration from those in the struggle and an abiding faith in justice is what will motivate people, particularly young people, imagine a world different from the one they are inheriting. My hope is to offer a starting point for those interested in those particular struggles and to link them together as they themselves has been linked together by the activists in order to uh, spark imagination and hope. So environmental justice is connected to uh, anti-gentrification organizing, um, uh, protests against police violence, struggles for water justice. Um, and in those um, are a politics and a vision that have never been dominant in the US um, in its role as an exemplar of capitalism, violence, and settler colonialism. 
So this book and uh, this talk honors the spirit and the work of the activists who have and continue to be in the struggle. It keeps our spirits up through the sharing of stories, credit and support. And the vision for environmental justice is against is one against in the, this is a quote from a, a remarkable poem that's worth reading by Langston Hughes called Kids Who Die. Um, he has this line in there where he talks about eating blood and gold and how the old, old will live on a while, um, but the kids will die. So I adapted that to say, well, right now we're in a moment where the powers that be want to continue to eat blood, gold, and oil. Um, but rather what environmental justice activists and the young people want is a different world. Um, that we want a world that makes care, work, food, energy, and lives matter and not cheap, disposable, and dead. This is not, this is an old idea, it's not new, but it's worth remembering our collective past as a set of practitioners interested in justice of all stripes. So our triumph is survival, the choices that we make and the stories we tell. And so, oh, I do actually wanna just read this last um, bit. Uh, from the Langston Hughes poet. Um, the day will come, you assure yourselves that it is coming when the marching feet of the masses will raise for you a living monument of love, of joy, of laughter, and black hands and white hands clasped as one, a song that reaches the sky, the song of the life triumphant through the kids who die. This idea of the life triumphant in the death are the lessons of the environmental justice movement. And in the struggles of people and communities made vulnerable to violence and whose continued survival is a direct challenge to the political and economic order addicted to carbon, capitalism and white supremacy. So environmental justice matters because it challenges these authorities of whiteness, extraction and violence through these voices, medias and perspectives. Um, art making and protest is life affirming in an extractive cap capitalist context that invites deaths of people, natures, and planet. Feeling for others is how we respond, and it is empathy. And empathy and analysis that has been in too far short of supply embedded in the political and economic structures that, uh, systems that structure our lives. Colonialism and slavery left ongoing legacies of economic abstraction that rendered organized violence normal. But justice movements reject this common sense of capitalism and such um, abstraction. So James Baldwin writes, people who shut their eyes to reality invite their own destruction. And anyone who insists on remaining in a state of innocence long after that innocence is dead turns himself into a monster. So that's why I, you know, I was saying, I remember my state of innocence you know, about climate change. And I remember it about police violence as well. So now is the moment of monsters. And, we seek, and, and those who seek to make their, their monstrosity seem logical, acceptable, and normal. But justice movements always remind us in their, in their slogans, in their protests, their music, against this logical monstrosity um, in things as simple as saying people and planet over profits. Environmental justice movements reject the slow deaths and the fast violence everywhere. It's about living and loving beyond the shadows and the numbers. Environmental justice is about love and creation in a moment that fetishizes death and spurns care. It's about reclaiming the ethics of morality and widening the circles to respect land and home and to acknowledge trauma in history. Hughes, Baldwin, and climate justice activists remind us everywhere that the old and the rich eat their blood, gold, and oil while kids, usually black, brown, and indigenous, die. This horror is to be recognized as a monstrosity. And our urgency now is to maximize our collective convergence towards an ethic of care in the spirit of solidarity and to bend the arc of justice and freedom from oil and all forms of extraction, hierarchy and violence. This time is now. So here's to all the environmental justice activists and believers, may our ranks grow. Those who sing, dance, breathe, uh, march and make art in our collective search to make the world, not in the image of those addicted to white supremacy, capitalism, oil, but to the vision of Stevie Wonder Saturn. Our collective triumph, the survival and sort of solidarity, the choices that we make and the stories we tell. And thank you, Lizzie, for the, the work you did in Indiana for the story you're telling in Indiana. There's so much work to do. Welcome to the future. So I'll end that there. Wow, thank you, Dr. Z. Um, yes, that's, that's incredible. And I think you've just underscored, we're at this inflection point, there's no turning back, right, to the normal. It's um, we, we have to make these decisions um, and this is this is the turning point. So um, I, I'm so impressed the work that you've done, you know, over your career and, and this book really distills it um, for us is building these connective tissues, um, as you said, threading together these stories because so often they're treated as these isolated um, case studies, right, of environmental justice. And um, 
I guess my first question, um, and I invite everyone, um, sorry, in the audience to um, put your questions in the chat box as we um, go to the question and answer session um, and I'll um, draw from there to um, ask Dr. Z our questions. Um, but I think this, this point about storytelling and narrative um, that you do so well saying that um, uh, the stories that we tell are always political, right? They're always, um, there's always a particular lens through which they're they're placed. So I'm I'm wondering, you've kind of underscored how scholars um, can take these stories and compare them and have an analytic behind them. How do you see environmental justice activists themselves um, kind of engaging in these comparative frameworks? Um, and is that a useful exercise? Is that what what is that done in terms of solidarity and environmental justice activism? Yeah, I think it's really important. One of the things I didn't talk about, um, I had a picture of, but I didn't talk about it at all, is this Flint healing walk where um, the, the water justice activists in Flint did a healing walk from Flint um, and connected their, you know, the mass lead poisoning and cover up of their city um, to the water privatized shutoffs in Detroit. And so the idea of you know, there's an embodied storytelling, you know, that their voice matters. Um, when they got to Detroit, they did a people's tribunal where they did it sort of like a, a sort of acting out a kind of court performance, you know? And so I think, you know, performance and storytelling is a really, really fundamental part to environmental justice movements. Um, and in part because environmental justice, you know, when it started to be named as such in the 80s, was basically trying to um, reframe the idea of environmentalism away from, you know, as you know, as an environmental historian, the idea of, you know, environment means wilderness and conservation, and it, mean, it means a certain narrative um, around John Muir and, you know, um, Pinchot and so on, um, to say that environmentalism also meant people in cities, people of, uh, people of color, people, uh, laborers, and so on. So environmental justice, um, the idea of like centering whose story gets told and how it gets told is in a lot of ways like a very, like maybe a core value of environmental justice movements. Um, and saying, you know, for example, when I was founding director of the Environmental Justice Project, one of the ones that I talked about, um, there were some storytelling projects, again, not very expensive. They weren't like, they didn't bring a ton of money, but they were incredibly important because they reframed the story of, you know, the Central Valley and UC Davis um, as one, um, our accountability as an institution has always been on the side of, in, you know, industrial agriculture and growers. And so to say, you know, the story of those um, laborers, farm laborers, or those impacted by pesticides, you know, can tell their story and talk about what that industrial agricultural landscape looks like on their bodies, you know, that's a really powerful epistemological like reframing thing. We get to tell the story. We're not just, you know, nameless workers in the field. We are, you know, people with names, people with communities, people with histories. And so that's such a powerful, important um, act in itself to say that we are not just victims, we are agents in this narrative. You know, we're not just acted upon and, and suffer, but, but, and, but our, we, our suffering matters and you need to hear and, and see it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I also, you, you mentioned Standing Rock a number of times um, and the significance um, of, of that in our recent, you know, moment of environmental justice. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, Indigenous struggles um, as they as they intersect with um, issues of the environment, with climate change, um, and how you know if we look at um, the Dakota Access Pipeline and the lessons we've learned thus far, um, I'm just curious about what what lessons we can take from this moving forward. I know you mentioned um, uh, the activism of youth there has been particularly powerful, harnessing social media, um, but what else would you say have been kind of the the main points that we can take away from this? Well, I think that um, one of the main takeaways um, is that the indigenous worldviews without like being reductive you know, and simplistic because, you know, there, there's so many different native nations in the U.S. and there's so many indigenous peoples around the world, but, you know, to, and there's a lot of scholarship on there. So I'm just shorthanding when I say indigenous worldviews, understanding that there's a lot of complexity, but the idea of, um, 
you know, the connect, the sense of connectedness and the sense of um, relationship is really different. Um, and so that's why, you know, when you saw at Standing Rock, you know, water is life or, you know, um, uh, one of the main um, people who started the Standing Rock camp, you know, she was saying, this is our, these are our relations. You know, the water is not a resource. It's actually like, you know, that's our, we feel that that's our people. And that, you know, these, these are not just grave sites that you have to be aware of, like to check a box, like those are our family members, you know? So the idea of like temporality and space and land, you know, is very, very different from, you know, one that's the dominant, you know, way that, you know, looks at um, resources as something to be, you know, measured, extracted. I remember the first time I came across the idea of like ecosystem services, which I understand the need to sort of quantify, you know, within, that context, but I remember just thinking, wow, like that idea of, you know, the resources or something that you have to, you know, quantify and, um, you know, measure is a, it, there's a really fundamental difference, you know, between, you know, the ontology is really different to think of, you know, connectedness, not just as a cliche, but as like really how you view the world, you know what I mean? And it's why, you know, at Standing Rock, you know, when uh, there's, you know, there, it's very complicated, there's a lot of history there. Um, but, you know, the Supreme Court basically, you know, said that the, their, one of their um, claims against the US um, was right, but, you know, we can't do anything about it. So take this amount of money. And the tribe says, no, we're not going to take the money. We don't want money for land. You know what I mean? So now it's worth billions of dollars because it's just accrued interest. You know what I mean? And so, you know, the idea of land is not something that you can just buy or sell. You know, if you think of your, you know, the land and the water or the air or the animals as your family member, you know, that's a fundamentally different perspective. And one that I, I think that we can, you know, that's really important, especially now. So. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, a question that's come in, environmental justice is receiving more attention from the US federal government now than at any previous point. Um, what do you make of this? Can the federal government make any useful progress without the systemic change you argue is necessary? Um, yes, that that uh, question is, is, yes, it is receiving more um, uh, at any time, which is fabulous. Do you know what I mean? And it's also, I think that these things are not um, either ors. I think that that's why the climate justice is really important because what they talk about in some ways is very radical, but that's also, they try to um, think about how that works and how you actually move values within those frameworks. You know, so um, it's a pretty radical and very connected to, you know, uh, Latin American ideas of Buen Vivir and regeneration and, and uh, degrowth. But then they also are trying to say, okay, well, what does it look like in practice in these particular um, contexts? And so I think, you know, yes, the, what I find really interesting in the climate justice movement is um, a radical politics, and in some places, um, also a deep engagement with the existing systems. So I don't think that it's a binary of like, you have to choose one or the other. I think the movements themselves, you know, live with, within these contradictions or these um, tensions. And so I think that, you know, it's, you know, there's no, uh, I think, yes, there is, all that stuff is happening. And, you know, what I wanted to, you know, just do by throwing out a bunch of things is to actually encourage people to, you know, watch Sorry to Bother You or watch the North Pole or spend some time with the Climate Justice Alliance. It's a remarkable alliance of alliances. And there's important regional work that's happening um, uh, that are trying to um, do exactly what the, the, that person who asked the Q&A you know, said, how do you do this work on a practical level? So that's the question. So I think, of course, having people who are in um, mainstream and administrative capacities who understand, you know, the, the movements and, you know, is, is a huge factor. So, you know, this idea of, you know, there's an in environmental justice question of what's the role of the state, you know, is this a non-state movement? You know, there, there are, um, these questions always exist within social movements. You know, how deeply do you want, want to be involved or, you know, is this basically, you know, um, are you are you captured by it? You know, what what are those? Um, but I think those are in, inevitable questions and tensions. Um, but I think especially in matters climate, you know, there was a, a article I saw recently that said all hands on deck. Do you know what I mean? And so that's how I really like that because I'm like, OK, huge problems, all hands on deck, all things matter, however you do it, however you're coming into this, you know, the struggle is everywhere. So, you know, let's not spend a lot of unnecessary energy attacking people for how they're, they're engaging with the struggle. Right, thank you. I, well, it looks like we're at one o'clock. I was gonna try and get one more question in. Um, 
for those who can stay, I just, I want to ask, um, it's a, this was an undergraduate student asked, um, after undergraduate school is finished, my schooling is finished, what do you recommend for a student who wants to find a career in environmental justice, science, sustainability, et cetera, as their next steps? Um, so you said, listen to the scientists, to the youth, um, but what, um, what advice do you give your students um, who are passionate about environmental justice? Uh, well, I think that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do the work, you know, so again, this kind of builds off the all hands on deck, you know, argument, which is you could be somebody who becomes a teacher and teaches, you know, at, at the elementary school level, but you're, if you're involved in curriculum change, you know, that like California is involved, is uh, updating its science standards. I think one of your, your um, colleagues from the history department is involved in that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, you know, you could do this work everywhere. You, you don't necessarily have to do it as your paid career. And I think that's, you know, there are so many people like who came out um, after George Floyd, you know, and so on. And so the idea is like, people have to answer that question for themselves. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And figure out how this plays out. Do you know what I mean? Um, as a paid career, there's a whole you know different set of questions. Um, but I think that not everybody has to do it as a paid career. Like you could do it in you know in many myriad forms, and then figure out you know what does this look like you know in this in this way. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a a great place to end for us. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Z. Really appreciate having you join us and share your insights. Um, and just thank you so much for your work. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, this will be posted um, uh, with the ERA website. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.